finishing up one-sided limit. We're going to use everything that we have learned thus far about one-sided limits and put it in a real-life situation. How can this actually help us in a real-life type of problem? Well, let's go ahead and see this supposed problem in a real-life setting. In certain situations, it is necessary to weigh the benefit of pursuing a certain goal against the cost of achieving that goal. For instance, suppose to, to remove X percent of the pollution from an oil spill, it costs C thousands of dollars given by this function here. 12X over 100 minus X. This is a three-part question. In the first part, we want to know how much does it cost to remove 25% of the pollution, and then how much to remove 50%. In part B, we want to sketch a graph of this cost function. I encourage you to do it by hand and then double checking it with the calculator. And then part C, what happens as X is approaching 100 from the left-hand side? Now we're focusing on 100 here because we obviously want to remove 100% of the pollution. So that leads us to the second part of the question, is it possible to remove all or is it possible to remove 100% of the pollution? I suggest that you pause the video and see if you can answer all three of these parts to this problem on your own. If not, see how far you can get on each part individually. Okay, the first part should be really easy, but before I actually do part A, let's talk about the variables in this problem. Because if we can understand that, that helps us understand the rest of this word or applied problem. So first thing that we wanna know is what does the X variable stand for? And it tells us that X stands for percent of pollution that we want to remove. So X is the percent of pollution that we can possibly remove. The other variable that we need to look at is what is the function name. In this case, it's C of X, but what does that actually stand for? So C of X is going to tell us the cost, and it is in thousands of dollars. So just like we just said, C of X is in cost, but in thousands of dollars. So that helps us set this up at least mentally in our mind. So the first question is how much is it going to cost to remove 25% of this pollution? Well, all we have to do is plug in 25 in for our X and that will give us the cost. So on the top we have 12 times 25. On the bottom we have 100 minus 25. So on the top, 12 times 25 gives us 300. On the bottom, 100 minus 25 gives me 75. And we divide this out, we give us four. But if we want to know the cost of this, we should label it. Not only four, but that means it's going to cost us $4,000 to remove 25% of the pollution. Now let's go ahead and move on to the second part, C of 50. 12 times 50 over 100 minus 50. 12 times 50 gives us 600, divided by 50 in the bottom. Cancel out a zero, 60 divided by five gives me 12. So that tells us to remove 50% of our pollution, it's going to cost us 12,000. And so hopefully you can see the higher percentage that we're going to try and remove, the higher the cost is going to be. Now to get a whole visual of this graph here, let's move on to part B, which asks us to sketch a graph in this function. I'm going to use the four parts that we learned back in sketching graphs or rational functions, and then I'm going to put all those pieces on the graph and double check it with my graph and calculator. So, one of the first things that we want to know is some points on the graph. The easiest point on the graph to find is the y-intercept, and we do that by substituting in zero. If I substitute in zero in the numerator, I get zero, and so that's going to give me my whole y-intercept at zero, zero. So this graph goes through my origin. 
The next part, we also want to know another point on the graph given by the x-intercept. We do that by setting our whole function equal to zero, or really we know the denominator can cancel out, so we set just our numerator equal to zero. Of course, that's going to give us the same point because we already knew it went through the origin. Another part is we want to know what about our vertical asymptotes, and we find those by setting where the denominator is equal to zero, so that tells us that we have a vertical asymptote at 100. So think about that if we're trying to remove 100% of our pollution. The last thing that we use to help us sketch graphs of rational functions is we looked at either horizontal asymptotes or oblique asymptotes, depending on what face case we're in. Here we are in the middle face case. The degree of the numerator is 1, and the degree of the denominator is 1. So we just need to divide out our leading coefficients. In the numerator, my leading coefficient is 12. In the denominator, my leading coefficient is negative 1. So that tells me I have a horizontal asymptote at negative 12. So let's put all of this information on a graph. Doesn't give us much, but it gives us a little bit. So I know that I have a point at the origin. I know I have a vertical asymptote at 100, so I'm obviously not going to use my tick marks by 1. Let's go ahead and go by 25 here. So 25, 50, 75, 100. 125, 150. I don't really want to go any less or any more than that because we're talking about a percentage. It doesn't make sense to have a negative percentage, and it doesn't really make any sense to have larger than a 100%. So I just need to draw my vertical asymptote at 100. Now I have a horizontal asymptote at negative 12, so let me go my scale on my y-axis by 5. So 5, 10, 15, or in fact negative 5, negative 10, negative 15. So I have a horizontal asymptote at negative 12. Now if I want more information, I in fact already have a couple extra points on this graph. We did that in part A. When we plugged in 25, we got out 4, so that gives me a point at 25, 4. So let me label my vertical axis here. So when I plugged in 25, I got out the point 4. And when I plugged in 50, I got out the point 12. So I can plug in 50 and I get out the point 12. So this gives me this here. That should give me a great visual of what we know so far. If you don't know how the rest of this graph fills in, then I encourage you to use your graphing calculator. So I'm going to substitute in my function here, 12x divided by 100 minus x. Again, separating the numerator and denominator by parentheses, so we know to, to divide them out separately. Um, I can graph it on a standard window, but we know that that's not the best window because we already had to alter our graph by hand. So our graph went from basically 0 to 100, or that's the very minimal that it should go by. I'm going to go a little bit farther out from each of those so you can actually see the endpoints of my graph. So let me go by negative 25 and 125 here. My scale on the x-axis, we used 25. Now my y-min and my y-max, we had on our graph to go by negative 15 up to 15 with our scale of 5. May not be the perfect thing to go by, but that at least gives us a starting point and we can adjust it from there. So now let's see what this graph looks like given by this scale here. So we see this blue graph here, which gives us a starting place of this graph, but I don't think it gives us the full visual effect. 
we know that there is a vertical asymptote at 100, and I'm not really seeing that in this part. So I know that if there should be a vertical asymptote right here. So maybe let me go farther out on my y-axis, larger than 15 and maybe, in fact, smaller than negative 15 here. So let's increase it by quite a bit. Let's go from negative 50 to 50. Let's see if that's enough. And I'm going to go ahead and keep my scale at 5. So that's a little bit better. Now I'm starting to see this vertical asymptote here at 100 that I expected. And I want to really emphasize it, so let me do it just a little bit more. I'm just going to increase my Y max over here. Let me go my Y max all the way up to even 100. And since it's so large, let me adjust my Y scale to go by 10. And now we really see that vertical asymptote here at 100. So now I can fill in the rest of my graph. So I know my graph is going to follow this horizontal asymptote at negative 12 here. It's going to curve around. It's going to hit these points. And then it's going to curve around and follow my vertical asymptote up there. Now, this is definitely not the best sketch of this graph because my window is a little bit off or my viewing range is a little bit off. But this at least gives me the visual of what I'm looking for. Now, there is an actual second part to this graph. So remember, if we have one vertical asymptote, there is actually two parts to the graph. And it is going to be down here. We didn't see it on our calculator because we still are missing a lot of the graph down here. And we didn't graph it initially over here at first because it doesn't apply in this problem. But I just want to remind you how many parts of the graph you should be looking for. One vertical asymptote should give us two parts to the graph. Okay, that is going to help us with part C of this graph. What happens as X is approaching 100 from the left-hand side? Is it possible to remove all the pollution? Well, we know that there's a vertical asymptote at 100. And we know as we get closer and closer to 100, our cost, that's our vertical part of this graph here, our cost function is going to get larger and larger and larger. So if we do the limit of this the computational way, the limit as x is approaching 100 from the left of this function, Numerator, 12 times 100 becomes quite large, but the denominator is going to give us zero. Now, if we just wanted the limit as x was approaching 100, that means our answer did not exist. But we're focusing on the left-hand side here. So we should plug in something close to 100 from the left. So let me plug in 99.99. Now, if I plug that into the numerator, that tells me I'm going to get a positive value. If I plug it into the denominator, that tells me I'm going to get a positive value, which means my overall answer here is positive. So, if we have something divided by zero and there's a vertical asymptote there, we need to plug in x on the appropriate side, which we did on the left-hand side, to figure out positive or negative, because we know our answer is going to be infinity because it's following that vertical asymptote. Our answer here is positive, so that means our overall answer, the limit as x is approaching 100 from the left-hand side, is going to be positive infinity. So that's the answer to the first question. So is it possible to remove all the pollution? No. Our cost will increase indefinitely if we try and get closer and closer to this 100%. So it is therefore not possible to remove all of the pollution. And hopefully you should have known this answer because that's what the graph was there to help us with, to get that visual. If we looked at 100, again, we saw the cost rise indefinitely, 
So we know the closer and closer we get to 100, the more and more it's going to cost us. So that goes back to how this problem starts out with. It is necessary to weigh the benefit of pursuing a certain goal against the cost of achieving that goal. Of course, we would love to remove all of the pollution from an oil spill, but the cost is going to be so much that it's not worth it. So we're going to have to stop at a certain percentage. Now, whether that's 90% or 95% or something more or something less, we have to weigh the benefit of that against the cost of that goal. So now you can see how one-sided limits can actually affect us in a real-life situation.